we are joined by a face, a voice that you have come to know very, very well, although we will delve a little bit more into his life and his background. Frank Nabilo is joining us, a 14-time winner amongst the professional ranks. He won five times in what was then called the European Tour. He's also won on the PGA Tour. Uh, he was a teammate, a member of International President's Cup teams multiple times. All told, he played in 254 European Tour events, 172 on the PGA Tour side, 56 total top 10 finishes, which is incredible when you think about that. And he had plenty of those in major championships as well. Uh, he was appointed a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 1998, which speaks to his character. Delighted to welcome Frank Nabilo to the show. And, and Frank, thank you so much for taking the time. I guess the first question I would have for you, just jump right in here, if I may, is your kid in New Zealand, you end up becoming a world-class golfer and now one of the faces and voices of the game. What were your early inspirations? Who did you look to in this game and go, you know what, that's a person that I think I'd like to aspire to be like? Well, Matt, uh, first of all, great to chat to you. Um, and you're going to lead with a, with a really hard question to start. Um, I, I have a vision, really, of the 1975 Masters, which to me is my favorite. But also as a kid in New Zealand, we used to get some of the big sporting events, whether it was Wimbledon or Augusta. And I know Augusta is just around the, uh, around the, around the door two weeks' time. Um, and in 1975, it was Jack Nicholas, Johnny Miller, and Tom Weiskopf. So I, I got to see, you know, this great triumphant, three different styles of play and, uh, you know, a long, just a phenomenal golf course that, that everybody is sort of so uh, you know, aware of. And um, I just love the, the difference in styles of play. The, the, all three were really at the sort of peak of their careers. And um, oddly enough, too, you know, I got to work a little bit alongside Johnny, got to know him very, very well. Tom Weisskopf, the late Tom Weisskopf, sadly, is like a mentor to me, and obviously I've spent enough time with the great Jack Nicholas. So it was such a lasting impression, but you're right, New Zealand, it's so far away. So for me, the dream of ever living in America, let alone playing in America, it just seems so far away. But that was really the first, uh, first fishing expedition into the great game of golf where I took it seriously and thought this would be phenomenal to be involved in. Were you surprised or did it come naturally to you that you were able to pick up the game and, and be so proficient at it? Um, <clears throat> that's a tough one. I, I guess when you're not exposed to it, none of my parents had played it. I had very, I had a low bar. I had, I had zero expectations. I hadn't seen enough great golf, you know, side by side with somebody. So for me, I was allowed to just experiment the first couple of years and just hit a ball. And, and actually initially it was on a beach. Um, iron sand, which is like the black sand beaches. There was a, my, my parents uh, had a small beach house and there was a couple of golf clubs left there. So you could just swing away and hit. And then, you know, I, I played a lot of other sports. I played rugby league, which is not rugby, the ones that everybody talks about that New Zealand plays. I, I was a middle distance runner, basically any sport, love tennis. So by playing a lot of other sports, you improve your hand-eye coordination. And then I got into golf sort of seriously when I was 13 got on scratch, the old handicap system when I was 16. So it did develop very, very quickly. But once again, I was in a very, very small goldfish bowl in New Zealand. And then I was lucky enough to win the New Zealand Amateur on my 18th birthday. I was the second youngest or youngest ever to win it. So that's when I started to take the game seriously. And I was lucky also the era that I played in, because I think if I was the same age, you know, in New Zealand right now, that jump to professional golf would just be so much bigger. And in those days, the developmental tours, Australasia was an extremely good tour. Um, there's a lot of events. Asia was quite prominent, the Asia and the Japanese tour. And then of course, the goal was then to go to Europe. And then if you were really, really good, then you went to America because that's the way everybody else went. David, the David Grahams of the world, the Greg Normans of the world, Baker Finch, you name it. Anybody that came from our neck of the woods, that was the path that they traveled. In those early days, Frank, was, was golf for you an idle enjoyment, something just for fun to, to mix in with all of these other sports? Was it an escape <clears throat> from something else uh, or did you have higher aspirations? No, it was an escape to be brutally honest, Matt. Uh, my parents were going through a divorce when I was 16. 
So with golf, one of the beauties of the game, it's played by such a diverse nature of people, male, female, young, old. But when I became a member of my first golf club was a golf course called Waitakere. It was a country club. And I don't mean, you know, $100,000 joining fees. This was like $100 New Zealand dollars a year to join. And the members would pick me up on a Saturday. And obviously they were much older than me, so they would stay for a drink, for example. I couldn't, it's too young. So I'd go and, and basically hit balls or try and play holes when it was borderline dark. And then when it was time for them to take me back, they'd drop me off on the way home. And like I said, none of my parents played. And then, you know, divorce is never good. My, my daughter also went through the same thing. And um, so you need something that you can just, that consumes you. And golf did consume me. It, one day was always different from the next. You played in the morning, it was different than playing in the afternoon. The very, very same golf course, seven days in a row played differently every single day. So I, I love that, you know, the nuances of the game. I love that it was sort of calculating. There's a little bit more time before you got to hit the shot. So I realized there was an emotional part of it. Your mind had to be stronger. Um, you could hit a bad shot and how that would make you fritter away shots on the next few holes. So there was a lot of areas in my life that I had to shore up. And I was very, very fortunate that golf helped me do that. How cool was it Frank, for you to realize that as you started to emerge on the global stage, that you also became, whether you meant to be or not, you became a representative of an ambassador, if you please, of New Zealand. Because back in those days, particularly as you were cruising through parts of the, the broad width of playing on the European tour and then coming to America, you're going to run into people that wouldn't even know, and I mean this respectfully, but they wouldn't even know where New Zealand hmm. is. And here, you, yeah. and David, and Nick, and, and you've got these prominent players that are emerging from there where people had to scratch your head all of a sudden and go, where was it again you were from and, and what's it all about? And here we are these years later and we're talking about New Zealand. Once again, you're, you're promoting the virtues to the world. Yeah, I, that happened by accident. I, I can't take credit for that really, but, but you're right. I, I was surprised because as a, as a kid in school, we learn about politics all over the world. We, we, we studied geography, we studied history, and New Zealand uh, history doesn't compare to Britain, for example, or let alone America. So for us, we, were, we knew where the, you know, the United States was and what North America was, what South America was, Asia, or whatever. We knew where all the countries were. And so I was amazed where people would go, oh, you're from New Zealand, where's that? And I'm like, well, you know, don't you have a globe or a map? You know, you can figure it out, right? And everybody thinks it's, well, not everybody, but a lot of people think it's on the other side, on the uh, Western side. And I'm not great with geography, you know, with, with um, navigation, that's for sure. Uh, on the Western side of Australia. And so I, even now I have a lot of American friends that want to go down to New Zealand and they go, well, I'm going to go to Australia first. And then, well, we might extend our trip and go to New Zealand. And I said, well, if you fly down, you realize you're going to go over New Zealand first. And they go, no, no, it's further away. And I go, no, it's not. So yeah, that did surprise me. And then it's such a small country. For me, when I grew up, New Zealand was three, three and a half million people. It's nearly double that now. That was a big country. I think it was 1981. I'd never seen a city that big. And I was completely lost. And, and also you would, you know, when I was a kid, if you got lost, you would almost tap someone on the side of the side of the shoulder and go, you know, can you, can you give me a lift? And things were different. I, and a, lot, a lot of it's here too. People didn't lock their homes. So it was great, great to grow up in an environment like that. And, and I've always said to friends where I live now, you know, travel is the best educator in life. You know, your show's called Fair Way of Life. You know, golf has taken me just about all over the world. There's a few places I still want to visit, but I've been fortunate enough to go to all the great golfing destinations and a lot of other ones that I'd want to visit as a tourist. And that's pretty neat, really, I guess, from a kid from New Zealand. When you think, Frank, of the, the emergence of the President's Cup, and I know detractors will look at it and say, well, the United States is dominating the President's <laughs> Cup, and is there really a competition there, et cetera, to which, for me personally, I think, you know, pump the brakes for a second, let's let it continue to develop. When you look at the early years of the Ryder Cup, it was a spirited competition. It was about even, but immediately following the Second World War, again, the Americans dominated before the whole of Europe came in and it kind of balanced the scales once again. My personal feeling is, uh, Frank, that when it comes to the Ryder Cup, 
I think part of the motivation and success of the European Ryder Cup team has been this effort to prove to the mighty United States that, you know what, we're good players too, and we can compete and we can be as, mm. as good as you. It's kind of that underdog mentality. Uh, when it comes to the International President's Cup team, how much is that same kind of let me prove it to you mentality there? And what does that uh, to, uh, relay in terms of the future of the President's Cup? Well, um, excellent question. It, it's there's, there's two ways of looking at the President's Cup. Obviously, the result is one of them, how important it is. And you referenced Europe. I remember Ken, Ken Schofield when he led what was the European Tour then. And for him, it was very important for validation of his players. And he was fortunate too that he had an era. I'm gonna say what the, they were born in 1957, the big five. You had Biasteris, Faldo, Langer, Lyle, and uh, Ian Wozniak. I was gonna say, I nearly missed Wozzy. So you had five of the best players in the world. That's nearly half a team of 12. So they really wanted validation that they were, you know, they were already winning major championships. And they wanted a chance to prove that, uh, you know, that Europe, Europe was a big deal. So it wasn't just about validating the players, too. It was validating the tour. And remember, too, and just prior to that, there, there was two golf balls. People don't talk about that enough. And, and really, the, that generation of Biasteris, you know, Faldo and, and, and co were the first generation that really started to play most of their golf with the large ball. Some of the, the, the generation before would flip back between the small ball and the big ball. So equipment was getting standardized. And, and that's why I've always sort of spoken out with equipment, how equipment changes the way professional golf plays. As soon as there's an innovation, for example, metal woods, the game changes. As soon as you go from wound ball to solid ball, the game changes, it's gonna benefit some other players. As soon as you, the advent of the 60 degree wedge, the utility club, the game goes through these changes. So the big ball, small ball really sort of gets pushed under the rug, but that was big for, for, uh, for international sides. Now, fast forward to the President's Cup, we didn't have the same um, challenges that, that the Europeans, or it was Great in Britain and Ireland in those days. But we did have the challenges of, of actually not having one tour, because remember, we include South Africa, who has its own tour. We include Asia and Australasia. So Australasia, New Zealanders and Australians were used to playing against each other. We were foes. South Africa is also you know, a great uh, rugby nation, so they were also sort of foes. And then Asia, we really didn't have a lot to do with at that particular part of time. So the hardest thing for the international side is trying to get some sort of commonality but it was very important to validate those region, regions. So whether you were Jumbo Ozaki, for example, who was on our team early on, or a young Rio Ishikawa, it was very important for them to um, represent their region. Obviously for me from New Zealand, it was huge for New Zealand, for young New Zealand players to come through. Australia has always been very, very strong as is South Africa in golf. So it was more about the knock-on effect of how it would benefit the game in those era, era, areas. But you're right, the, the, the winning tally is actually, well, be brutally honest, is extremely poor. There have been very spirited challenges, certainly from the international point of view, but um, the results just haven't sort of stood out where it's going to make people watch and say, I've got to go to the President's Cup because it's, you know, it's like the Ryder Cup. It's not yet, not even close. Frank, when you left the game, you left because of injury. Did you have a time when when you had kind of a why me type of emotion with that? Was, was there a bridge for you to cross? A bridge, it was, it was a Grand Canyon. Yeah, I was, I hit the lowest point in my life. I, I, I would wake up every day saying, why me? I got diagnosed with inflammatory polyarthritis actually in my official rookie season um, in 97. So that was, you know, your first year, uh, I'd already won two Sarahs and World Opens. They were in Atlanta. They were like a precursor to the World Golf Championship event. So I thought my game would translate here. I'd won Greensboro, but um, three days in the May, I said, this, this isn't going to last very long. So I, I tried to sort of eke it out another four or five seasons. But, um, but yeah, if you ask my wife, I, I would have been a, a misery to, to live with. Probably still, she'd probably still say the same now. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it was... It was very much why me, why me? But I was lucky because the, the very channel that we're on right now, the Golf Channel, is just down the road where I live. It's like 15, 20 minutes away. And um, after about a year on the couch, uh, I, I was very, very fortunate 
And I'm the first to admit that, that I was given a, a second career. So in the end, golf has given me everything in my life, whether it's uh, walking the fairway, trying to hit a, chase the little white ball or cover it with TV. So uh, after all these years, I consider myself very, very fortunate. It's, it, television's a funny thing though, Frank, isn't it? Because the, mm. the, the presumption that most people have in watching what we do is that somehow you get trained where the reality is more that you kind of get thrown in the deep end and they see if you can swim. Uh, what was the transition like for you to go from player where you're used to answering the questions that you're asked to all of a sudden realizing, no, you know, I got to, I got to make sure there's a little more meat on the bone. <laughs> well, you can be a little diverse as well, but be, I, I love your analogy about the swim because I asked a very good friend of mine, uh, Renton Laidlaw at the time, I said Renton, I'm thinking, right. uh, Renton went from a, a, a very good rider to really the voice of, of, of golf in Europe there for a while. So I remember picking the phone up, ringing Renton, and then I said, can we meet when I'm in Europe next? So we chatted away and I said, I, I'm seriously thinking of TV, you know, like, please just tell me I'm being, being crazy. And he goes, no, like he said, if you ask people, they're going to tell you something different. Everybody's got a different way of how they solve the issue. And he said, oddly enough, he said, look, it's, it's like a swimming pool, except the difference is in TV, you jump in the deep end. He said, if you can paddle around for a little while, you'll survive. I said, if you can't, then just get out and find another job. So as I, as I mentioned, Golf Channel, we're, we're early on in it. Um, they had a show called Live From, started up the very first year I was there. And we had two producers. Uh, one was Eric Saperstein, who I think you know. He works at Full Sail in Orlando to this day. And the other was Matt Hegarty. They were very, very diverse. Matt is still with the Golf Channel now and still produces live from. But Eric Saperstein was very buttoned up, very formatted, and Matt was the opposite. So along with Brandel and uh, I'm trying to think who the first host was, whether it was Craig Can um, of, of Live From in those days before Rich. And so we could learn under a format and therefore it was a very good learning curve. And then when the show was produced by Matt, Matt was very much sort of tell me what you're thinking about. So we could be sort of go off on your own tangent. And, and it was great to learn in those two environments, but deep down, I, I preferred live golf. I always did because I guess in some respects, I felt like it was unfinished business just to get out there and, and at least be a little closer to the game, the, the live version. I actually think it's, it's truer. So that's always really where I wanted to go. And I was lucky, I, my very, very first live tournaments, I worked with Keith Hirschland, the producer, who's an excellent producer. And he helped me with some basic rules, television rules, which I think a lot of people still break today, talking over the shot, for example, um, the hit. And, uh, and also Jim Kelly was the first host that I ever worked with. Jim had done just about every other game. So he taught me you know, things that you would think that are logical, like your cameraman. I mean, he's your best friend. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't understand it at first. You know, he told me how TV actually works. So along the way, I, I was I, I, lucky that I ran into a lot of good people that helped point me in the right direction. Frank, I love asking players for, that, that played during the time that you did. Now, Lowly's 30 years plus ago, and you, you were talking about the era of you know, Sandy Lyle and, and, and Nick Faldo and company in Europe, the emergence, and that would include uh, Seve Ballesteros, and, and, Ballesteros and, and that as well. However, if you could, would you have traded places with today's players? If you could, instead of playing in the era in which you did compete against whom you did play against, if you could play in today's era of golf, would you switch? Why or why not? <laughs> Financially, the answer is easy. The, the, the answer is very easy. Of course you'd want to play now. I just saw the other day, was it Scotty Scheffler won $4 million at Bay Hill. I'm, I'm excluding the Players' Championship here. And the very same week, there was an opposite tournament, Puerto Rico, where Bryce Garnett won. Bryce Garnett, the total prize money was $4 million. So Scotty wins, it's the same week, right? Scotty wins $4 million for first, and the total prize money at Puerto Rico was $4 million. So the game has changed dramatically. Tiger Woods had a huge impact on that. So from a financial point of view, then there's no question. Uh, I think I've, I've, I'm on record. I think golf is right now for the sport and the audience. I think uh, they're overpaid, massively overpaid. That, that's no disrespect. That's just if you consider apples for apples. But the generation that I played in, um, and especially the time that I had in Europe, you, 
you learned a lot more. I, I think you were less naive, you were less mollycoddled. Um, and, and I think people had a better grasp of reality in the generation. And the generation prior to me would probably say the same thing as well. They'd probably say their generation had a better grasp of reality, reality than what mine did. But I like the fact that there was a struggle. You really did know what $100 meant. And, um, and now, you know, it's, as soon as you win, you're flying privately. I know that's a generalization. Um, they are, the, the, they've taken it to the nth degree, hearing Jay Monahan the other day just saying, I look after 200 players. I'm like, no, Jay, you don't. You actually look after a lot more than that. You still look after the Champions Tour. You look after the Corn Ferry Tour. You are actually our custodian to the game. And I think we've lost, we've lost touch with that. The, the, the viewers are getting turned off because they hate this acrimony that we all know. I mean, the elephant in the room, right? Because they play the game. That's so important. So, you know, if Jay was also on the court, so no, Jay, you actually look after the game that everybody watches. And the fact that we can't agree with the USJ and the RNA when they want to change something, you know, there's an obligation. And I just think this generation has sort of forgotten part of that obligation at times. Do you think then, Frank, that uh, that the game, at least at its highest competitive tiers, is it in a dangerous place? Oh, it's very much so. Hindsight's twenty twenty. It's we're in the same spot we really really were three years ago. And I know it's easy to say, and it's and it's tough. But if JP picked up the phone, then would we be in the same spot? The answer would be no. We, if if it looked like the same spot, we'd be in it for a different reason. Um, and, and that's why you get paid the big bucks, I think, for those decisions and in any company. And it's tough. It's very, very hard. But, you know, the buck has to stop with somebody. So, yeah, it is dangerous because we're not big enough. Um, the game is too slow. I know. And part of that is because the ball goes so far and, the, and they're trying to make the courses so hard. So, yeah, I feel for the guys. The green. Um, but you know, these things out there where it's like five lane high where we get five times a week and obviously the, the motorway slows down. We're slowing down, but we're not a five lane highway. We're playing smaller fields every week. It, it, this, this year has had great stories. Sad viewer home doesn't know enough of the players that have broken through because normally that would happen at a slower pace. So that part's happening quickly. But the actual game, um, you know, I like all the innovations. I'm a tech freak myself, and whether it's Aimpoint Express or whatever, but you know, if it takes 60 seconds and it takes more than that to hit a shot, right? If they played like people used to in years gone by, 40 seconds, right? You would be able to show a third more shots. That's a lot more. I know people want to see more shots, and I heard that the other day, just show more golf. It's not that hard because people take forever sometimes over a two-foot putt. I, I didn't think I was a speed merchant, but you know, relative to now, and I, and I think that's where you have to look at the product and you have to look at the people playing. And, and, and people do copy. The next generation is going to copy what they do. And you already see it. I see kids here at the lobby are doing the same thing. So we're passing on a slower version each generation. Um, if I watch basketball and they took a minute or two minutes, every free throw would go crazy. You really would. Or a penalty kick in soccer. Um, and that's what we're doing with our sports. So, yeah, I, I really do think we need a micro and a macro view of our game. And at the moment, it's just all about money and keeping top players here and all this and, and just sort of kicking the can down the road. Decisions have to be made and they have to be made, made quickly. And they haven't been. When you talk about the macro view, I, I'm gonna, I want to take it out even a few more lens bumps because the game of golf, of course, is not only about the professional game, the, the touring professionals. Mm. The game is booming at what I call the 99.99% .99 level, everybody yep. else. And yet at the professional side, you reference this fan fatigue. There, there's a dichotomy there. And, and I'm curious about mm. your, your comments about how the game is booming like it never has before on one side where the other side seems to be searching. Yeah, that's the, you pinpointed the problem. I, I was at a birthday party last night. You know, we're always going to get a live question and, and whatever. And they're good people. They, they play golf. I live in a golf community. And they would rather go out and play. The golf that's played today is at an incredibly high level. I think it's as, as high as any level ever. So the standard of golf is incredible. But, but you're right, they're tired because all they hear about is all the, excuse the terminology, the crap that's going on in the game. 
but they love it. We golf benefited benefited from COVID more than any other sport because we were outdoor, and people did. They took up their clubs again. I mean, it's wonderful to be outside. You know, whether you believe in 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 global warming or not, fresh air out there playing with your mates. Whether you you know you have a drink in one hand and play golf, or you're very studious and serious about it, whether you play music or whatever. There's so many different ways for people to play recreational golf, and so many different venues. It's a great way to travel. And then at the very top of that, obviously, are these amazing players that these people used to tune in and watch all the time. You know, I know from the TV point of view, I'm very proud, like of the CBS team, for example, of how hard they've, they've been working over the last few years to try and get the best product out there. But there's only so much you can do sometimes, but the low, it's low hanging fruit. So people will always point the finger at commercials. Well, there's absorbent fees that have to be paid for a start to make sure that the players are playing for more money. So how can you pay an enormous amount of money for a broadcast and then have, and a lot of it goes into the prize money and then you've got to, you've got to have the commercials and the players play slowly. So, so you really have to look at the product sometimes honestly and say, well, what are we being given to show these people that want to see golf at the highest level? Rather than watch on TV and sort of wait two minutes to see one shot hit, they can go out in the range and hit 10 or 15 balls. We are only a couple of weeks away, Frank Navalo, from the event that rises above all the noise with the Masters. You have, I'm sure, the, <laughs> the pleasure and the honor of being a part of that broadcast team with CBS. What are your thoughts heading into this Masters? What, what do you feel like are the big storylines coming in? To be part of that event, it's special when um, in the usual rankings, all of our different ways. Everybody talks about world rankings now, and it wasn't that long ago when that was not a criteria. So for a start to be invited, so if you're one of the comp you know, competitors that are playing in it, it's, it's huge. It's 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 something that you remember. You, you always remember your first playing of the Masters, and you remember your last as well. And as a broadcaster, it's no different. There's an obligation to just do the best job you can. We have a team, I think, more than ready for that. Um, but then the other part of your question, I guess, to me, it's going to be the closest thing to what I remember three or four years ago of just golf. Pretty much everybody that should be there is going to be there, and we'll just do a golf tournament. And we will, as we sort of jokingly say in the industry, we'll crown a champion. And that'll be so refreshing to do that. Whether it's a Brooks Koepka or, you know, whether it's a John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy, it doesn't matter. It's about a Masters champion. And, and I think that's going to be refreshing to people at home because that's the golf that they're all craving for. They don't want to hear about all the other stuff. They have their favorites, whatever tour they play on, and they'll be able to just see them compete. And, and we will see, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, yeah, the best golf we've seen all year because that, that conflict um, is going to be sorted out, you know, on a, on a wonderful venue, whether it rains, hails or shines. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it just being about the golf. Frank Nabilo finished fourth at the Masters back in 1996. Frank, you are an absolute legend. It is so much fun <laughs> to catch up with you, and I'm sure we could go on for hours, but I do appreciate the time that you've given us, and, and I very much look forward to you joining us again, if we may. Certainly, Matt. I know you've got a busy day. Thanks for having, on my, 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 thanks for having me on, my friend. Absolute delight.